But I myself have found that the kind of technocratic elite that dominates society has huge institutional and legal power, but has just got very little experience of winning hearts and minds or leading political struggles, and is estranged from the lives of most people in society. It's a very much top-down affair that means that decision-making is done in seminar rooms and committee rooms, but it's far removed from the pesky opinions of ordinary voters. But that means it's got no finger on the pulse and misreads the mood. So the day after the referendum result in 2016, a leading journalist said, I don't recognize my own country. Uh, to which I wanted to say, well, you ought to get out more. During the build-up to that referendum, people kept saying at panels that I was on, does anyone know anyone who's going to vote leave? And I'd say, yes. And they'd say, well, who are they? And you think, well, go and meet them. People didn't expect it to happen. And even in this general election, people were shocked and horrified that leave still meant as much as it did to people. When you uh, turn citizens into a passive object, it means that technocratic regimes become insulated from public pressure and create their own closed loop world of echo chambers. Public figures in the media and think tanks and cultural institutions and uh, uh, political parties, uh, basically a lot of the places that I hang out generally, um, know that their career advancement depends on, not on the public, but on networking well, on learning PR skills, on going on media courses, on learning a whole set of linguistic rules, you have to know what hypo, uh, uh, you have to know what cisgender means. You have to understand intersectionality. You have to understand about trigger warnings. You might need a whole dictionary associated with diversity etiquette in order to survive, but people know it. There's a kind of lingo. When I went to the U European Parliament, coming from the Academy of Ideas, which I'm the director of normally, um, I was expecting, you know, I'm used to argument and debate and reason is the norm. And I, and I wanted to go to the European Parliament. So I expected that at least, you know, if I'm going to have to be there, then at least I can join in the debates. But actually, I discovered there was an absence of any meaningful debate. The EU Parliament, in a way, is exactly my example of where there's no sort of sense of kind of argument and discussion as we'd normally understand it. The European Parliament is all about a kind of discussion on prearranged communiques, uh, carved out positions around political groupings, uh, indulging, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, discussing uh, what are basically predetermined votes. It's kind of impenetrable to rational debate. In fact, the only debate there is is how to enforce or respect the rules. Uh, rules are what is everybody talks about. There's no real sort of spontaneous, open discussion. But everybody seems to feel at home there, and everybody speaks the same lingo. But there's no passion, and there's certainly no feel for the lives of ordinary people. And I think it explains why so many people in so many countries, or a layer of people in so many European countries, are so attached to the European Union. If you're increasingly ruling a void at home, and you're increasingly conscious of a yawning gap between the rulers and the ruled, then the European Union provides a safe haven where you recognize everyone else and you ironically speak the same language despite the fact you don't speak the same language. There is a kind of language of technocracy. I think the process of European integration since 1992 uh, Maastricht Agreement was actually all about a retreat from alienated voters at home, seeking legitimacy in terms of ever closer relations with other EU member states. And in that sense, the EU is a club of ruling elites. And by the way, the UK was a willing member, although that's not always how it's presented. So just to say this to you, this is a contested point. For traditional Eurosceptics, i.e. the people on my side of the debate, the European Union is out there, something foreign, a supranational entity that threatens national sovereignty by its multitude of regulations and directives and rules. But I do think that they misunderstand something. It is, of course, stuffed with unelected elected technocrats at the European Commission who lord it over national governments and national parliaments. But the view that the problem lies in Brussels, not London or in Rome or in Dublin or in Paris, is, I think, wrong. Because in my opinion, that supranational entity that is somehow has um, that... Sorry, the EU is not a supranational entity that has somehow usurped power from member states. 
In fact, if you think about something like the European Commission, the EU central bureaucracy employs 25,000 people, but the idea that those Eurocrats have taken over and have run uh, the, 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 uh, what's happening of 700 and 400, sorry, 741 million citizens is just ludicrous. I don't believe that at all. I don't think that they are the problem in a straightforward way. My argument is that the EU was set up as an institution to put a break on democratic decision-making at home, but with the agreement of the ruling elites of each of the countries that joined it. It actually curtails popular sovereignty in nation states. That's often superficially seen as a democratic deficit question, is that if only EU citizens could vote for the EU president, or if only the EU parliament um, elected MPs could initiate legislation, but I think that misses the point. The democratic, democratic deficit is not a design fault, it's in the design because European uh, integration locks in uh, a, a rigid set of rules that denies the demos in each country accountability, uh, 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 accountability. The European Union structure breaks the link between decision making and the public. It ring fences ever more decision making from popular contestation in each nation state. It's not a product of an EU power grab but rather the dynam dynamic towards European integration is driven by a decline of faith in democracy at home in each nation state and absolves national governments of the burden of having to consult us, the voters, about important political social matters in favour of various expert cliques and technocrats. In other words, the ruling class at home outsources decisions to the EU. It's done voluntarily. The EU's rigid rules-based system allows political elites to make decisions in private amongst themselves. And this is the idea. They then return to their own populations and pretend those decisions were an external imposition. I know that the British establishment wrote half of the legislation that's imposed on Britain by the EU. What happened was they say, we've got an idea. They go over to the uh, European Union, they put it forward as an idea, but it's far easier to persuade the EU than it is to persuade the British public. And then they come back and they say, we didn't do it, it's an EU rule, what can we do? So the EU becomes their alibi, a way of uh, getting out of uh, being held to account. And so I think that that means that the EU, for me, represents there is no alternative institutionalised. Okay, to finish... One of the most galling aspects of uh, any debate on the European Union is the conflation of Brussels-based uh, Brussels oligarchy with Europe per se. The idea that if you're anti-EU, you must be anti-European, or that you must be a petty nationalist, a little Englander, versus uh, uh, being pro-EU and an internationalist. But if I can just say, I consider myself an internationalist and I'm a proud European. I consider that the EU grates against everything that is brilliant about European values. Some of the key values to emerge from Europe, particularly its Enlightenment project, were things like freedom, popular democracy, sovereignty, nation states. Take that very European value of national sovereignty that wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for the European Enlightenment project. When the e uh, uh, EC uh, President Jean Claude Juncker proclaimed when he was, borders are the worst invention ever made by politicians. We have to fight against nationalism and block the avenue of populists. That is a constant theme, that nation states are problematic ever so yesterday, that nationalism is dangerous. But for me, nation states are not inherently reactionary. And in fact, in a democracy, democracy happens at a national scale, historically. And those geographic units are the only way that ordinary working people have managed to exercise any political influence. So the anti-nation states rhetoric of the EU is an attack on voters. We have national parties, national parliaments, national policies, nation states for good reason, because that's how we exhibit our ability to hold people to account. And that's what I am trying to leave the EU to do in terms of making UK politicians accountable to voters. When the supporters of the EU tell us uh, that, it's an, that the EU is an inspiring union of European peoples, I think that's rubbish. It's a union of European elites who want to avoid the people of Europe and their own electorate. 
and want to insulate decisions about business, about the economy, about rights from any challenge at home, why don't we ask the Greek people about how they felt about the austerity imposed on them? So now we have the Brexit populist revolt, and I think that the, the insulation tape has been ripped away, and the British public have said, this is what we think. You've got to listen to us. Our voice matters as much as yours, and, I'm de and I'm, I demand that you listen to me. And I think at last, with the general election, the British ruling class have been forced to listen to the British people, and I think it's about time and the start of an exciting new era. Thank you very much.